Magic is a very complex game with very complex rules. Players, especially newer players, often have trouble understanding a lot of the rules and often make mistakes. So today we're going to go over a bunch of the cards with niche or confusing rulings, explain how they work, and rank them by how confusing their rulings are. And at number 10, we have Xur the Enchanter. This is a 1-4 with a mana cost of 1, 1 white, 1 blue, and 1 black. It has flying, so it can only be blocked by other creatures with flying, and it has the ability where, whenever it attacks, you search your library for enchantment with mana value of 3 or less and put it into the battlefield, and then shuffle. So, what's so confusing about this card? On its own, it's not too bad. The difficult thing is figuring out what happens if Xur puts an aura into the battlefield. Normally, when you cast an aura, you have to target something that an aura can target, and it enters the battlefield attached to that card, or the player, in the case of curses. If an aura is on the battlefield and isn't attached to anything, it has to be put into the graveyard. So, if Xur goes and finds a Darksteel mutation, it should be put into the graveyard after it enters the battlefield, right? Well, no. You see, Wizards added a rule for this specific situation to make auras better, specifically Rule 303.4f. In the comprehensive rules, it says that if an aura is put into the battlefield by an effect that doesn't state what the aura should be attached to, its controller chooses a card for it to enchant as it enters the battlefield. Now, the card they choose has to be a card that the aura could enchant, so Darksteel Mutation has to go onto a creature still. However, what makes this ruling really interesting is that nowhere in the rules does it say that this targets. So, when you cast an aura, the rules specifically say you have to target what you're trying to enchant. However, no such rule applies when choosing what to enchant if you put an aura directly into the battlefield. This gives cards like Zur extra utility, where if you tutor up an aura removal spell, they can actually put them onto creatures with Hexproof, Shroud, or Ward with no issues. This applies to auras entering the battlefield without being cast by any means, not just Zur's ability. So if you have a card like Brago, you can blink all of your auras to attach to them whenever you want, even if they have Shroud. Now, this is one of those rulings that's more unintuitive at first glance rather than confusing. A lot of players play this wrong the first time they use one of these effects, or don't understand why their commander with lightning greaves on it is still somehow removed, when it's supposed to be safe. A lot of the rulings on here will be things like this, cards that you have to have somewhat niche knowledge to know how they work, or work in unintuitive ways. And at number 9, we have Blood Moon. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 2 and 1 red, with the ability where all non-basic lands become mountains. So, what's so weird about this effect? First off, how does it interact with lands that come in tapped? This can be a bit tricky because Blood Moon's ability only works on lands already on the battlefield. So, are these lands on the battlefield when their ability applies, meaning Blood Moon takes it away, or does it apply before they enter the battlefield, making it too late for Blood Moon to do anything? Well, the answer comes to us in Rule 614.12 which among many, many things, states that when applying replacement effects, which is what these abilities technically are, you take into account how they would exist in the battlefield and what abilities would apply at that point. So, as something like Highland Lake enters the battlefield, we see that when it enters the battlefield, Blood Wound will make it a mountain with no abilities, so its Enter the Battlefield tapped ability won't apply. The next ruling that's also somewhat difficult to figure out is Blood Moon with Urborg, Tomb of Yogmoth. Urborg has an ability that gives each land the Swamp type in addition to its other types. So if both of these cards are on the field, what land type does Urborg have? The answer is solved by a rule called Dependencies. This means that if a card's continuous effect would depend on another continuous effect, we wait to apply it until after the effect applies. Urborg making itself a swamp depends on it having the ability, which depends on Blood Moon not being on the battlefield. So Urborg's ability won't apply until after Blood Moon's ability applies, at which point it won't have the ability in the first place. And at number 8, we have Stratus Dancer. This is a 2-1 Jin Monk with a mana cost of 1 and 1 blue, has flying, and also has a Megamorph for 1 and 1 blue. This is an ability that means you can cast it as a face down 2-2 two -two with no abilities for 3 mana. Then, while it's face down, you can pay its Megamorph cost a little bit face up and put a 1-1 counter on it. It also has the ability where, whenever it's turned face up, you counter target instant or sorcery spell. The thing about Stratus Dancer and all the other Morph cards is that Morph doesn't quite work the way you think it would. Most people would assume that Morph is an activated ability. However, Morph is actually what's called a special action. Special actions are actions that you can take that aren't casting spells or activating abilities, and they don't use the stack. The most common special action is playing a land from your hand. The reason that it being a special action is so important is that, like I said earlier, it doesn't use the stack. That means that if a player casts an instant or sorcery, as soon as you have priority, you can flip up your Stratus Dancer to counter it, and your opponent can't respond to you flipping it up. The Stratus Dancer will get flipped face up, 
Your opponent can respond to the trigger, but they can't use a removal spell to kill it before the trigger goes into the stack. Additionally, this interacts in a really interesting way with the Split Second ability. Split Second is an ability that makes it so the players can't cast spells or activate abilities while their spell is on the stack, except mana abilities. However, it doesn't say you can't take special actions or trigger abilities while they're on the stack. So, if you have a face down Stratus Dancer and your opponent tries to cast Cross on Grip on one of your cards, you can flip it to counter the spell. This makes flipping Morph Creatures one of the only ways to interact with Split Second cards in the entire game. And at number 7, we have Trini Sphere. This is an artifact with a mana cost of 3 with the ability where, as long as Trinity Sphere is untapped, each spell that would cost less than 3 mana costs at least 3 mana to cast. Now, this card can be a bit difficult to understand on the face of it, which is why the reminder text on the card has an example to help you figure things out. Basically, if you would pay 1 red mana for a card like Lightning Bolt, you instead have to pay 2 and 1 red, that way it costs 3 mana. However, this gets more complicated with other cards that increase or decrease the cost of cards. If you have a Goblin Electromancer and your opponent has a Trinity Sphere, how much will an Impulse cost? What about if they have a Sphere of Resistance in a Trinity Sphere? What if they have multiple Trinity Spheres? Well, there's actually a process for figuring this out. Basically, when you're figuring out how much a spell costs, you do it in a specific order. First, you add all of the cost increases from cards like Sphere of Resistance. Then you apply all cost decreases from cards like Goblin Electromancer. Then after doing all that, if there's a Trinity Sphere on the board, you check if the card costs less than 3 or not. If it does, you increase its cost to 3. So it doesn't matter how many cost decreasing effects your opponent has, if there's an untapped Trinity Sphere, it has to cost at least 3 mana. It doesn't matter how many Trinity Spheres on the board either, as the ability only applies once. The interesting thing is that in the game rules, there's basically a specific step in determining the cost of spells that is there specifically to account for Trinity Sphere. There are a few more corner cases we should go over, Effects that allow you to cast spells without paying their mana costs don't get around the effects of Trinity Sphere, or other cost increasing effects for that matter. Even if your opponent has an Omniscience on the field, if there's a Trinity Sphere out, they need to pay 3 mana for each spell they cast. Another corner case that can be confusing is abilities like Improvise, Convoke, and Delve. You see, these abilities actually allow you to pay for spells by doing something like tapping your creatures or tapping your artifacts. Unlike with casting a spell without paying its mana cost, which sets the cost of the cards at zero, these abilities don't change the cost of the spell, they just let you pay the cost in a different way. And at number 6, we have Wandering Fumarole. This is a land that enters a battlefield tap and can be tapped to add 1 blue or 1 red. It also has the ability where you can pay 2, 1 blue and 1 red to turn Wandering Fumarole into a 1-4 blue and red elemental creature, with the ability where you can pay 0 mana to switch its power and toughness until the end of the turn. Wandering Fumarole is kind of a stand-in for any card that switches power and toughness but Wandering Fumarole was the most heavily played of these cards that I'm aware of, so it's the one where this ruling comes up the most. You see, swapping power and toughness has some weird interactions with stat buffs. So if you use the Fumarole's ability to make it into a creature, swap its power and toughness, and then play a card like Sheer Strike on it to give it a plus 3 plus 0, what will the Fumarole's power and toughness be? It should be a 7-1, right? Unfortunately, that's not how it works. You see, Magic the Gathering is like an onion. It has layers. Yes, we're talking about layers. In Magic, when determining what order we apply continuous effects, which are effects that continuously apply to cards in the battlefield, we use layers to decide what order we apply those effects in. The last layer, layer 7, is split into five sublayers. First, we apply characteristic defining abilities, which are abilities like Tarmogoyfs. Then, we apply effects that set stats to certain values. Next is effects that add or subtract stats, like Sheer Strike. Then you apply the stat boost or nurse from counters that are on creatures. Then in the final layer we apply power and toughness switching effects. So when we start trying to figure out the femoral stats, we don't just look at what it's like right now, we start looking at all the effects on it and track them through these layers. We start with femoral's own ability, which sets its power and toughness so it applies on layer 7b. So it will be 1-4. Then in layer 7c we apply sheer strike so it will be 4-4. Finally in layer 7e, we apply the power and toughness switching ability, which means it will stay a 4-4 since its stats are the same. Layers are a really weird and hard to understand part of Magic's rules, which is why this isn't the only time they'll be appearing on this list. And at number 5, we have Kalidus, Traitor of Ghent. This is a legendary 3-4 vampire warrior with a mana cost of 2 and 2 black and lifelink, which means dealing damage causes you to gain that much life. It also has the abilities where if a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, instead you exile that card and make a 2-2 black zombie creature token. You can also pay 2 and 1 black and sacrifice another vampire or a zombie and put 2 1-1 counters on Kalidus. 
Now, Khaleesi's ability to exile your opponent's dying creatures and make zombies is really good. What makes it even better is that it's what's considered a replacement effect. This means that it replaces the action of a creature dying with it being exiled, so it won't trigger die's effects. Now, the weird thing is what happens if replacement effects would try to change the same event at the same time. For example, if someone controls both a Rest in Peace, which would exile the creature card if it would be put into the graveyard from anywhere, and a Kalidus, Traitor of Get, and an opponent creature dies, what happens? Well, when multiple replacement effects are trying to apply to the same event, the owner of the modified object chooses the order in which the replacement effects are applied, and you keep applying the effects as long as they still apply. So, when your opponent's creature dies, your opponent will actually get to choose whether Rest in Peace or the Kalidus applies first. Since your opponent would never choose to give you a zombie for free, this effectively means that Kalidus will never give you any zombies while another similar replacement effect is on the field. Though, if you're able to control your opponent during their turn, using a card like Mind Slaver, you would get to make the choice for them, so you could get a zombie in that way. And at number 4, we have Croc Clan Ironworks. This is an artifact with a mana cost of 4 and the ability where you can sacrifice an artifact to add 2 colorless mana. Now, Ironworks ability is what's called a mana ability. And mana abilities have a few extra rules. Mana abilities don't use the stack, so they can't be countered with cards like Stifle. Even more important, you can activate mana abilities while you're casting a spell or activating an ability to pay for its cost. Before we get to why this is important, let's look at another situation to get even more context. Let's say you have an Ironworks and a Mirror Retriever which is an artifact creature that returns another artifact from your graveyard to your hand when it dies. So, we want to sacrifice both of these artifacts to make 4 mana. When we do that, Mirror Retriever will trigger and try to give us back another artifact from our graveyard. Now, if we sacrifice our Mirror Retriever first, our Ironworks won't be in our graveyard when it triggers, so it won't be a valid target for its trigger. But if we sacrifice our Ironworks to its own ability first, we won't be able to sacrifice our Retriever. This is where the ability to activate our Ironworks while paying to cast a spell or activate an ability comes in. You see, abilities can't trigger until after we're done paying for a spell or ability. So let's say we want to cast something like Mystic Forge. Now, what we're casting doesn't matter in this interaction. All that matters is that we're trying to cast something. So we go to cast Mystic Forge. Now we have to pay for the spell. So we activate our Ironworks and sacrifice your Retriever. Your Retriever can't trigger yet because we're still paying to cast our spell. So then we sacrifice our Ironworks, making the mana we need. Our Forge will be paid for, go onto the stack, and then our Retriever will trigger. In this case, our Ironworks is in the graveyard, so it's a legal target for the Retriever's trigger. The thing that makes this so confusing is that it goes against the way people usually cast spells in Magic. You see, in Magic, you can either simply activate all your mana abilities before saying the spell you're going to cast, or announce what spell you want to cast, and then pay the mana for it. Players usually do the former, but in order to make this trick work, you have to go to cast the spell, and then start activating mana abilities. The fine details of how this works isn't well known amongst Magic players, so knowing the Mirror Retriever won't trigger if you sacrifice it to Ironworks while paying for a spell until after the spell is on the stack is even more niche. Worse, not only was Ironworks a really strong card, but this specific interaction was a big part of the decks it was played in. This makes Ironworks one of the few cards I know of that was banned because, at least to an extent, it caused so much rules confusions at tournaments. And at number 3, we have Humility. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 2 and 2 white with the ability where all creatures lose all abilities and have a base power and toughness of 1-1. One, one. This is a classic confusing ruling, so a lot of people probably know where this is going. There's this card called Opalescence, a 4 mana enchantment which turns each other enchantment into a creature with a power and toughness equal to their mana value. So if you have 2 Opalescence, they'll both be 4-4 four, four creatures. If you play Humility, the Opalescence will try to turn it into a creature. If a Humility is a creature, it will lose its own ability due to its own ability, but if it doesn't have the ability to take away its own ability, it should have its ability, but if it has its ability, it will take away its own ability, and this logic loop will continue forever. On top of that, Humility will be taking the Opalescent's abilities away because they're currently both creatures. But if they lose their abilities, they aren't creatures anymore. But if they aren't creatures anymore, Humility doesn't apply to them. And we have a second infinite logic loop here. So, how do we resolve these logic loops? Well, I did say we'd be going over layers again in this video. Because all of these effects are continuous effects, we'll be applying them based on layers. So the first layer we care about is layer 4, which is where type changing effects take place. In this layer, both copies of Opalescence will apply their effect to turn all the enchantments into creatures. Next we go to layer 6, where ability granting and removing effects are applied. In this layer, Humility will apply its effect to take away all three of the card's abilities. 
Now, it may seem like we have an issue here. We haven't reached layer 7 yet, where we set the power and toughness of these cards that are now creatures, and all the cards have lost their abilities. However, one of the rules of layers is that once an effect starts applying, all of its effects must apply, regardless of if the ability gets removed. Basically, what this means is that since both of the Opalescence and the Humility have started to apply their ability in one of these layers before their ability got removed, the entirety of that ability will be applied even though they lost their ability. So, both abilities will be trying to set the power and toughness of these cards in Layer 7. Next, we go to Layer 7, where the Opalescence will be trying to set the power and toughness of the creature to 4, and Humility will be turning them to 1. All of these effects are going to try to apply in the same layer, Layer 7b to be exact, so how do we decide what order to apply them? Basically, we use what are called timestamps, which basically means we apply them in the order that the effect started. So, since both copies of Opalescence were on the battlefield first, we first apply their effects turning each creature into a 4-4. After that, we apply Humility's effects, which will set them to be 1-1. So, all four of these enchantments will be 1-1 creatures with no abilities after we finish applying these effects. This is a very unintuitive ruling, and luckily, it gets even more complex. You see, because we're relying on timestamps, or the order in which these cards enter the battlefield, the result will change based on what order we play the cards in. If we start with Humility and then play the Obolescences, we'll end up with each creature being a 4-4 because Humility's ability applies first, and then gets overwritten by Obolescence. However, the weirdest result is what happens if you play an Obolescence, a Humility, and then a second Obolescence. You see, Obolescence's ability doesn't apply to itself, which is why we had to use two copies in our example. So if you play the cards in the order of Obolescence, Humility, Obolescence, what will happen is that the first Obolescence will apply, turning the Humility and the second Obolescence into 4-4. Then Humility applies, turns them into 1-1s, and then finally, the second Opalescence will apply and turn the first Opal and Humility into 4-4s, four but since it doesn't apply to itself, it will stay a 1-1. One, one. So, you can actually end up with a board where your enchantments are actually different sizes, which is not what anyone would assume what would happen when they read these cards. And at number 2, we have Reign of Gore. This is an enchantment with the mana cost of 1 black and 1 red, with the ability where if a spell or ability would cause its controller to gain life, they lose that much life instead. Now, this card seems pretty straightforward, but the wording here has some very unintuitive implications. Let's say your opponent had a lifelink creature in play, and you had Reign of Gore. Your opponent attacks you with lifelink creature. What happens? The Reign of Gore should make it so that when the lifelink creature deals damage and lets them gain life, they lose that life instead. Well, you need to read Reign of Gore more carefully. Reign doesn't look for when someone gains life, it looks for spells or abilities that gain someone life. So the question is, what's causing them to gain life here? You may want to answer that the lifelink ability is causing them to gain life, but that's not quite true. Lifelink says that a creature dealing damage causes its controller to gain that much life. So what's technically causing the life gain isn't the lifelink ability, it's the creature dealing damage. Since rain doesn't check for creatures dealing damage causing players to gain life, it won't apply. What makes this ruling even less intuitive is that there's another card called Tainted Remedy, which looks identical to Rain, but is worded differently, so its effects apply to any time a player gains life at all. This ruling is super weird and nitpicky, but I don't think it even holds a candle to the number one spot. And at number one, we have Panglacial Worm. This is a 9-5 worm with trample, meaning it can deal excess combat damage to the defending player when attacking, and it also has the ability where you can cast it from your library while you're searching your library. This is the one card on this list that instantly makes people double take when they read it. This isn't how cards are supposed to work in Magic. You're not supposed to be able to cast cards in the middle of resolving another card's effect like this. However, it gets way, way weirder. Let's say you have a Selvala, Explorer Returned out. This card has the ability where you can tap it to reveal the top card of each player's library. You add one green and gain one life for each non-land card you revealed, then each player draws a card. Now, Selvala's ability is technically a mana ability, so we can activate it while trying to cast out Panglacial Worm. So, if we cast Demonic Tutor to search our deck for a card, then try to cast Panglacial Worm off of the search, and then use Selvala to try and make the mana for the Panglacial Worm, we'll be drawing a card while casting a spell while searching our library. Now, this is a little weird, but luckily there's a ruling on Gatherer, the official MTG card database, that can help us out here. The oldest ruling for Panglacial Worm states that while searching your library, you must keep it in the same order until you finish shuffling. That is the rule that, for obvious reasons, basically never comes up, and is almost never in force. Though you should probably be careful if you're playing Panglacial Worm in your deck. So, if we activate Silvala to pay for Worm here, you'll get to see what we draw before we draw it, since we're searching our deck, and we'll just draw whatever the top card of our deck was at the time Demonic Tutor resolved. 
This gets way weirder if we consider what will happen if activating Salvala doesn't make enough mana for us to cast more. You see, Salvala's ability makes a random amount of mana, and even worse, it involves us drawing cards. Now, if you would try to cast a spell and during the process of casting that spell, it turns out that doing so would be illegal, the action and all the other actions that happen while casting that spell are reversed. However, you cannot reverse actions that caused cards to be moved from the library to any zone besides the stack. So, if Selvala doesn't make enough mana, we need to reverse the action of trying to cast Worm, but we can't reverse the action of tapping Selvala for mana. So we'll have to put Worm back into our library, but we'll draw the card and make the mana for Selvala anyway. Now, the weird thing about this is that you aren't allowed to knowingly make illegal plays, as that's considered cheating. Now, if you don't know how much mana you'll make, it isn't cheating because you didn't know that it was an illegal play. So, sometimes doing this could be cheating if you know that Selvala couldn't possibly make enough mana, but it won't be cheating if you could theoretically make enough mana off of Selvala, I think. This is actually a really difficult ruling and finding precedent for it is kind of difficult. My advice would be to just not play Panglacial Worm because the card is a ruling's nightmare. The ways that this card leads to very strange situations and no other card can lead to makes it easily take the top spot on this list. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other cards you think we may have missed? Or do you have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, please let us know down in the comments below.